Hey, I hope you enjoyed part one of my interview with Bruce Bennett. Before we head into part two, I want to tell you about a special promo code that you can enter at rossflats.ca for a special discount only for Rinks viewers. Head over to rossflats.ca and enter in Rinks20 to get 20% off your order. So once again, head over to rossflats.ca to take advantage of the special promo code. So Ross Flats Vintage Apparel and I are going to release a limited run of the Edmonton Garden sweatshirt. So you'll want to make sure to go to social at underscore the rinks on Twitter and Instagram and hit subscribe here on YouTube to get more up-to-date information. So stay tuned on that. Make sure you use the promo code. So here we go, part two with Bruce Bennett. Let's go. Hey everyone, welcome back to part two with my uh, interview with uh, legendary NHL photographer Bruce Bennett. Uh, now Bruce, we're living in kind of a crazy time period um, with COVID-19 and um, you know Black Lives Matter. And I kind of want to hear from you a little bit about when things outside the hockey world uh, are a lot bigger and how they affect the game uh, on the ice, whether it's uh, pregame tributes and stuff. And, you know, like I said, you're in Edmonton during uh, the Stanley Cup playoffs in 2020 and COVID. You had to quarantine yourself for two weeks. You, you managed to escape with your sanity uh, coming out of that. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've you got some colleagues that are working inside the bubble and you're not in the bubble, but you're, mm -hmm. you're shooting the game still. Um, how... How has it been? Like, obviously, the games without fans is a huge difference. Uh, but is there any other kind of differences that are maybe caught you by surprise when you arrived in Edmonton? Well, I mean, it's surreal. You know, being in an arena where you're, you know, there are games going on. Um, there are times, you know, you, you, I, I, I arrive at the game usually two hours early. I set up my remotes, set up the computer, double check everything, triple check everything until you screw things up because you're checking too many times. <laughs> right, right. And then you're sitting there and you're talking to the other photographers, there are three of us usually upstairs, three media photographers, and then you turn around and the players are skating in warm-ups and you go, oh, where, where the hell did they come from? <laughs> you know, right. It's yeah. like there's no buzz, there's nothing going on, but in the arena, um, they have the PA announcer. They have that crowd noise pumped in. Although sometimes, you know, it's kind of funny because there'll be a hit, and then like a second later, he gets uh -oh. ooh. And you go, <laughs> yeah. I think that guy's a little slow on the on the push button for the crowd noise. So that's kind of entertaining. Um, yeah, and and the signage in there is just kind of odd. And I said to the photographer next to me the other night, Are they doing all those all that signage? Are they just doing it for us? Because <laughs> It's the three photographers up there and just a very small handful of, of media people who are in the building. Right. Uh, but I guess all of that helps bring the players, as much as they tune a lot of that stuff out and they tune out the crowds, um, I think it still is a little bit helpful to, to bring them into the game. Right. And it brings me into the game a little bit. You know, and speaking of kind of major events, I was, I was, I was hoping to go back to, to 2001. Like you were born and raised in Brooklyn. You were born in Brooklyn, moved out to Long Island. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, a, a New Yorker. Um, I know I'm butchering that saying. I don't have the accent. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> not even going to try. Long Island. I'm yeah. a Long Islander. Long Island? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I tried Boston accent with a previous <laughs> guest, but no, not, not going to do it. I'll stick with my Canadian one. Um, but, you know... Obviously, September 11th was a, a huge uh, point in history for the country. Um, what was that day like for you? I don't know if you were working. I know September is usually the, the time of the year for NHL teams. You know, training camps start mm -hmm. and kind of get ramped up. Um, what was your September 11th uh, experience like? Yeah, it was a hockey story, actually. Oh. Uh, I was across the river because Long Island, from Long Island to New Jersey, got to get through New York City to, to get to Jersey. I was actually in something equivalent to a bunker at doing New Jersey Devils headshots oh, that wow. day. And um, I was working with a PR guy, Mike Levine, at the time, and, and um, he comes in. Uh, I, actually, he was the trainer, I, as I remember, uh, Bill. I, Bill, I can't think of his last name. He comes in and he says, man, a, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. Uh, oh, okay, you know, it's on TV, whatever, and then a second plane, and then, you know, you start... There's no cell service because you're in this this concrete bunker, so we really had no idea what was going on. And we're getting through the headshots, and then word is filtering in. You know, it's something massive. And um, you know, I said to the PR guy, like, 
let's move this along, right. you know, because I think at that point we had gotten through the players who were waiting for a few management people. I said, could you get your management people? I want to get the hell out of here. I want to go home. Right. Um, so finished up there and then uh, you get on, um, I, I remember getting on uh, one of the roads in Jersey going towards New York City to go north of the city to the George Washington Bridge to go home. And I remember coming around a corner and then you just see, you know, the smoke coming up. You see the, uh, I guess it was, I think it was, I don't know if both towers had done it. They must have both been done at that point. Uh, you just see the smoke coming and you're like, oh, you know, it's just like an awakening to see it live. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then it was torture getting home from there. It was uh, weaving, um, pulled off the road at one time. You know, delusional, you go, maybe I'll just go to a shopping mall and hang out for an hour. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, you're just not thinking clearly. Um, and then I got on the road. I actually went way north of New York City uh, to something called the Tappan Zee Bridge and then got to a ferry and took a ferry ride back to Long Island and was home uh, at night. Just wanted to be with my family at that point. Um, you know, over the weeks after that, uh, eventually, uh, at that point, I was team photographer with a few NHL teams, including the Rangers. Um, and it was very odd um, during training camp. I can't remember which players they had signed that summer, um, but I actually, which didn't happen that often, I got on a charter flight with them from uh, uh, Tarrytown, New York, I believe and flew out to Detroit was one place we stopped, Midwest trip, I think, Detroit, Minneapolis maybe, and uh, just flying on those days, you know, some of the yeah. first flights to be uh, up in the air was very, very weird and felt very strange getting on the plane. And as professional athletes, basically, um, you know, you get screened, but not all that carefully. So even that felt a little creepy as well. Going a little bit down the road in, in the schedule, you know, I think the hockey world was definitely tuned in on October 7th, 2001, I believe, um, with the Rangers' first home game. Sure. Um, you know, obviously you were there and going along the theme of bigger than life things happening, you're, you're at a hockey game shooting uh, photos, you know, as a uh, early 20s, uh, Jeff Nash was tuning into uh, that game in particular. I think all the hockey world was was tuning into that game. Is is there a different feeling, a different vibe, or what was the feeling of that night? Um, you said you arrived two hours before. Mm -hmm. You know, did you stick to the same routine, or does that does that t throw your whole routine out of whack? Yeah, um, since I was Rangers team photographer uh, that year, uh, there were some responsibilities before the game to get set up, but still probably about two hours prior. Back then, and, and Madison Square Garden is a pretty tight place to put remotes, so yes. I don't think at that point we were doing remotes. Uh, you check the strobes, make sure they're working, check the photo positions because we did have extra photographers on that night. You know, the sense of uncertainty, how is this all going to play out, who's going to do what, um, the image that um, it was actually brought up to me just this week, someone sent it back to me just as a reminder, was Messier with a fireman's uh, hat on, uh, helmet on. Um, so that brought back some memories, but I think you know as a journalist what's important in situations like that is to remove yourself from the situation. Right. Uh, you can cry about it afterwards, you can think about it afterwards, you can obsess about it afterwards, but when you're in that moment, you can't let emotions uh, get in, involved in your shooting right. uh, because it'll prevent you from doing your job. Right. So there was more, it's always more a case of, you know, am I going to be in focus? What do I have to worry about? Is the lighting going to be right? It's not so much as, um, you know, and also how am I going to document this and, and do justice. It's an interesting point, and I've seen you mention that in, in other interviews about, you know, whether it's something heavy like that or even a retirement, Jersey retirement or whatever, you, you kind of have to zone out and, and you're right, kind of focus on work. And from everybody else looking in, like you're, you are documenting history. And, and that photo that you mentioned, I was going to bring that up actually, uh, that as simple of a photo as that is, um, you know, technically. Compared... What do you mean by that? What's that? <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a headshot. Yeah. It's a glorified headshot. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, and you, you shoot stuff like that and you, okay, well, whatever, it's there, it's in front of me, I shot it. 
And then, you know, it takes somebody, a client to pick it up and use yeah. it. And then all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, and that's, that's why when it was brought back to me this week, I was like, hmm, okay, it's a headshot, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean. It touched somebody. Yeah, and, you know, it, in terms of that photo, it was one of the, that particular photo was one that everyone kind of, at least in the hockey world, ties to that event because, mm -hmm. you know, it was Messier wearing the fireman's helmet. And um, speaking of, of MSG, I did a, a top 10 rinks around the league. And uh, I actually did have Little Caesars at number one, but MSG is just like, just, I mean, if they could be tied for number one, maybe you could uh, articulate it better than I can, but MSG is, is a pretty special place. I, I always love going there. Um, what does MSG mean to you? Because I think as a child, you maybe have experienced the previous MSG before this one opened? Oh, uh, just because the hair is this color doesn't mean I was... I saw it on an interview, I swear. 1968, I mean, come on. <laughs> um, look, I went to the old, uh, the old garden, which is 50th Street and 8th Avenue, maybe, when I was 13. Went for the last Rangers game, Rangers okay. against Detroit. The only reason I remember is because I have a little ticket stub and I have a slat of chair oh, wow. from there. Because luckily there were four of us from the neighborhood who took the Long Island Railroad into the game. <clears throat> and one of the guys was a big guy, so he was able to stomp on the chair so we could each have a little slot. <laughs> Other people were walking. Sake. Yeah, a keepsake. Yeah. Everybody else was walking out with chairs, four chairs, six chairs, you know. So people are ones. literally like removing chairs oh, yeah. and just carrying it out? All you heard during the third period is the sound of chairs breaking. Oh you know, like God. imagine these days, you know, like uh, you would never get away with this. By the time... I the, had to buy these. Oh, yeah. I, I had to go on auction and we, buy these things. <laughs> yeah, we have Yan a Yankee Stadium uh, pair of chairs. Yeah, that was 10,000 Marriott points, 100,000 Marriott points or something or other. Um, but they were literally just taking... Oh, you just, you know, just smash stuff. I mean, people came with toolkits. I mean, wow. people were unscrewing signs, bathroom signs and stuff in the walls. It wow. was mass havoc. Wow. Um, so that's my only memory of the old garden. But okay. I, I tell you... Um, Matt, it's, I got to compare. I got to do a comparison for you. Madison Square Garden, I think that distinctive roof is part of what does it. Right. You know, like you walk in there, same as like you walk into Yankee Stadium and, you you know, the, the Bronx is gray and black and dark and all that stuff. And then you come up that runway into the stadium and you go, oh, my God, that it's an oasis. Yeah. That green, lush turf with an iconic scoreboard. I'm talking old Yankee Stadium. Yeah. And, um, you know, Madison Square Garden is that same kind of feeling when you walk into that building and you see that roof and you go, this is, this is it. Everybody wants to play here. Right. This, you know, and there are some times I capture players coming in from other, uh, other cities. They get off the bus and they walk past the Zamboni corner and say, hey, let me just take a peek. And they walk yeah. out and they just stand there and they look up at the ceiling and, you know, they, they just tingle a little bit. Yeah. I remember before my first time, because it's got a, kind of got that tannish brown color mm -hmm. um for whatever reason i, I thought it was wood for yeah. some reason yeah. but then when you go up the media press boxes is way up you almost can touch the roof and i'm like oh it's it's tin or yeah. it's just painted that way but it mm -hmm. still looks um and the unique shape of it it's a more kind of a, a like an egg yeah oval shape mm -hmm. it's not like the round corners like a lot of rinks are um i remember one of my visits there um i Snuck up to you on a corner, and we had a little bit of a chat while the game was going on when we were in, when I was in town with the Oilers. And uh, I remember you saying, you know, any day you're shooting an MSG is a good day. Yeah. And that kind of stuck with me. And and when I, I think I think I've been there two or three times. But you know, as a small town Albertan boy, being in you know New York, and mm -hmm. you know MSG is legendary, and and to be there is is pretty pretty darn cool. I want to throw one last question on to you. Uh, it's a little bit of a photo-related question, but is there a photo that has eluded you? Like, you, you've shot so much over the years. Um, most photographers or most, you know, uh, people who do visual stuff for a living, they always have a, a vision of, of whatever it is, the, the perfect photo or the perfect shot or whatever. Is there, is there a shot that's eluded you over these years at all? You know, the, the fact is uh, those shots elude me every day. <laughs> And yeah. it sticks with me. Yeah. And I've, I've always said I wish I was like some of the goaltenders in this league because they give up a shot and then they get right back up and their head is in the game most of the time for the next shot. And, you know, I, I take those losses so personally. I know that that's my uh, downfall at times. 
that when I miss something, it sticks with me, mm. like to the next day and the day after and the week after. And I tell this story about the first time I used uh, how to be a how to. Uh, I'm guessing at this point it was probably a 400 millimeter, and I've got it managed to get it to the hole, and I'm like, oh, this lens is great, and I'm shooting down to the other end of the ice, and with perfect symmetry, two players, like the puck comes in high in front of the goaltenders and the two players come up and their heads crash and the goaltender is in the middle and the puck is in there somewhere and I just cut both heads off. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so that perfect symmetry was just right there and I was like, oh, I love this lens and like, bam, too tight, you know? So it, it's, it's every day and, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's also though a case of um, what I equate the sport of hockey photography to is it's like the golfer. The golfer goes out and he sucks all day, but that one great shot yep. brings him back the next day. Yep. And that's what it is with hockey photography. You know, you get that one stunner or that one messier with a helmet, as stupid as that shot was to me at the time or mm -hmm. as, as a throwaway shot, that that shot resonated with someone else that's what brings you back the next day. I guess it, it'll keep you hungry, right? It does. Yeah. It does because you show up each game and as I said, you get there about two hours early. I look at the roster. I start thinking, especially if it's a team that I'm more familiar with, mm -hmm. you do your homework in your head. This player likes to go on the outside. This player likes to hold the puck behind the net. And you start thinking what's going to come your way. And then you start breaking it down remote camera by remote camera. What's going to go to that remote camera? What do you have to be... You know, you just don't, I, I don't get it, some of these guys who walk into a game, they're not professionals, they walk into a game, they put their, they load their camera and they're all ready to go. Yeah. Because without doing your homework, doing, looking at the media notes, seeing who's up for milestone awards or trophies or, or certain point levels, or you're not familiar with uh, any aspect of what you're going to shoot, you're not going to succeed. Yeah. Period. Yeah. You're just not going to be successful at this level. And most of the photographers who are shooting at this level, most of them in a typical Stanley Cup year are pros. Right. And they're guys who know their craft and they're guys that you better bring your A game. Yeah. Like Olympics. You'll go up against at a, a Olympic final like uh, the Crosby one in Vancouver. Yeah. You had 60 guys at ice level. You had 60 guys at center ice up high. you got 120 guys that you're going up against. Right. And out of that 120... 100 are your solid pros, yeah. and those guys will not be denied. Right. So if you're not going to be at the top of your game, you're not, you're not going to be at the, the cream of the crop. You're right. not going to survive at that level. Much like the players that you cover, right? Pretty much, yeah. 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 Yep, there are those who make it and those who don't make it, and you know, you can't have, you know, you just can't have uh, 20, 20 some odd stars on the team. You need the support guys or the guys who are going to get the job done. Right. But everybody's got to pull their weight and be capable of, of succeeding at some level. Anyways, some pretty awesome topics. Thanks for uh, sharing your stories. But now we get on to some fun bit. We get some, some trivia. So uh, let's head over to the quiz. Uh-oh. All right, Bruce. Welcome to the quiz. Uh, everyone's favorite part of this uh, show. We'll, <laughs> we'll see about that. Yeah, I, I always kind of tailor them to a little bit of, of their own history, so we'll see how you do. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, so okay. we're going to do five uh, trivia questions and then five goal horns. I think I asked you earlier, how, how well do you think you know your goal horns? Is there a seatbelt for this yeah. <laughs> or not? No, not, oh, a, okay. not, not these ones, no. Yeah, we'll find out. Okay, all okay. right, sounds good. All right, so let's head off with uh, number one. Uh, in 2002, Salt Lake City Olympics, uh, Team Canada won uh, gold 5-2 over the Americans. Uh, do you remember who scored the game-winning goal? He scored two that game. Dit Clapper. <laughs> Is that wrong? <laughs> uh, no, incorrect. I, uh, well, first of all, I was not at the uh, Salt Lake Olympics. Oh, okay. And so not that that's my excuse. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just... But I cannot remember what I had for breakfast, so uh, I can't help you with that one. Joe Sackett. Joe Sackett. I knew that. that yeah. Yeah, yeah. You okay. knew it. I just had to I, say I, it for you, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, this one's a little bit of hockey history. Um, so the Devils moved to New Jersey in 82. Where did they move from? Do you remember which city they moved from? Um, There's a team there now. Yeah, it's Colorado. Yeah, perfect. Good job. 
I was thinking Kansas City, Colorado, one of those, but yep. Colorado. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Number three, your first Stanley Cup final, which, by the way, I believe this is your 40th, right? This is 40 this year, this is yeah. Your 40th. Happy 40th. I'm, I'm expecting a cake uh, from I, you yeah, or someone else. I was half thinking about getting a cake, but then, uh, yeah, I didn't want to make you feel too a old. A COVID cake. A COVID cake. Thank you. A virtual cake. Yeah, okay, yes. good. Um, your first Stanley Cup final was in 76, mm -hmm. uh, and the Canadians swept the Flyers in four games. Do you remember any of the coaches for both teams? Philadelphia, uh, Fred Shiro. Yep. And Montreal, I'm just going to guess Claude Ruel. Oh, close. Scotty Bowman was... Same thing. <laughs> Two round guys. You, yeah. just said, you just said it in French. So okay. Uh, oui, translation. Oui. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> All right. Um, number four, some local history. Um, I'll see if you know this. Uh, Northlands Coliseum uh, was the last NHL rink to have this unique camera position. It was more broadcast related, but the cameras were situated in a certain way that no longer exists in the rinks today. Were they uh, in a gondola? Uh, no, but I do okay. love media gondolas, by the way. I hate them because I hate heights. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. You don't like heights. That's right, yeah. Um, no, the broadcast cameras were on the same side as the benches. Oh, wow. So you couldn't go in. You couldn't get a clear shot of... Uh, Interesting. Yeah. And terrible at the same time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, last one. Um, and I know you're at this one. Uh, April 18th, 1999, Gretzky's last game at MSG. Uh, he got a point, his last assist in the NHL. Uh, who scored the goal? Uh, Brian Leach. Brian Leach. Oh. There you go. All right. Well, not bad. Not bad. I, 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 got I a obviously 40, didn't tailor it enough for you. 40%. <laughs> yeah. I think that's failing. <laughs> um, all right. So the goal horns, um, I'm just going to play the sound for you. And it does have the uh, goal, or the goal song with it. Now, these oh, are a few years good. old. Good. Which will kind of, usually they kind of help people guess the, yeah. their ring because sometimes they're a pretty famous one. Uh, goal horns are brought to you by Famous Goal Horns. You can follow him on Twitter. He puts them all together for me. So I'm going to play, uh, play one for you. Yeah, that's the uh, Maid of the Mist boat that goes under Niagara Falls. <laughs> that's right. I have no idea. That's Philly. Oh. Wells Fargo. Boy, that Okay, if you say so. <laughs> uh oh. I, you know, I, I block everything out, so yeah. I'm going to get a zero on this okay, quiz. Okay, well, we'll try. Uh, let's try this one Nassau Coliseum, New York Close. Islanders. Close. Oh, did you say Madison? I thought you said Nassau. Nassau. That's no, no, Ma Madison. That was MSG. 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 Okay. Wait till the song. Oh, maybe. of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once you hear the song, okay. Okay. Do I wait for the song? Well, I don't know. Do you think you know this one? I think that's Nassau Coliseum now. Nope. <laughs> oh my God, that sounds so familiar. Probably the best goal, goal song in the league. That is a good one. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, no idea. Windy City. Oh, okay. Chicago. I don't travel that much anymore. I think he's just going to guess Nassau for the I'm rest just, of everything is Nassau. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Don't you play four. Nassau now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the ghost song is going to help you out with this one. But. Yeah, that sounds familiar, too. Any guesses? New Jersey Devils. Oh, he gets one, Holy ladies and gentlemen. Shit. That was so lucky. <laughs> and last one. I'll okay. stop torturing you. Last one. They all sound the same to me. Nassau Coliseum. I thought I'd throw you a freebie in there. <laughs> <laughs> Going on your uh, your guessing strategy, I uh, thought, you know what? If I throw that one in there, at least he'll get one. <laughs> I passed. Well, it's always just a bit of fun to uh, to get people kind of loosened up and, and having a little bit of fun. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, I guess, you know, in a, in a silver lining to this whole COVID madness, uh, you would never have come to Edmonton and you would not be in this seat. 
I got a lot of days to kill. I'll come back to your studio again tomorrow when you least expect me. <laughs> I, I got say, nothing going on. He knows where I live. He's gonna be. <laughs> he's gonna be here tomorrow. And be like, I want another crack at those gold horns. <laughs> Anybody home? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, hope you guys enjoy this episode, Bruce. Thanks again for coming. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks everybody for watching. See you next time.